Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We are so glad you're here. We welcome you whether you're here with us in the sanctuary. It's so lovely to see your faces. Or if you're joining us virtually online, we welcome you here this morning as well. Pastor Lisa is away on vacation this week. And that is why we have Reverend David Heinemann is going to join us in leading worship this morning. It's our joy to welcome him back here to Crooks. If you were here with us this summer, then you may remember uh, David and his wonderful time here with us. So it's great to have him back. Uh, I invite you now to fill out your Connect card. So in your bulletin or online, there'll be a place to indicate that you were with us this morning. We would love to know that you're here. On your Connect card, you'll notice that there are places to RSVP for the Easter breakfast as well as Wednesday night supper. If you have a physical Connect card, you might have to look at the front and the back to make sure you find all of your options there. This morning is the first Sunday in April, which means it's Communion Sunday. We'll be partaking of communion in two possible ways this morning. If you're in the sanctuary with us, um, then we have an option of intinction where uh, Reverend Heinemann will take a piece of bread, dip it in the chalice, and hand it to you. Or if you would like to have an individually packed communion element, those are available. Make sure that you have uh, received those. If you haven't, please raise your hand or see an usher, and they can make sure that you have those elements if you would like them. If you're joining us at home, I invite you now to have some form of bread and drink available if you're joining us during the 10 o'clock hour to partake in communion with us this morning. And next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and we're going to have a really wonderful service with lots of special music, so I, uh, I hope that you can join us then as well. So with that, I think that's all of my announcements, um, and let us prepare our hearts to worship God this morning.
I invite you to stand and join me in the call to worship by following along with the bolded lines. Praise the Lord. God shows compassion by putting things right. We are blessed by God to be Jesus' hands and feet, feeding, giving, visiting, clothing, sheltering. When did we feed Jesus, give Jesus a drink, clothe Jesus, and give him a place to stay? Feeding the hungry, caring for the suffering, clothing the naked, visiting those in prison. Whatever we did for one of the least of these, we did for Jesus. God holds compassion and justice together. Our love for God is shown by how we love and treat the stranger. Praise the Lord. Jesus has freed us from sin to love and serve. I invite you to join me in singing our opening hymn for the healing of the nations, number 428. may be seated. You may know that the first name given to Christians was not Christian. The first name given to Christians was followers of the way. Understanding that being a follower, a disciple of Jesus was not just learning a bunch of things, checking off some boxes, but living a life that looked like the life of Jesus, Christ living in me, as Paul says in one of his letters. 
one of the fancy words we use in church sometime is the word sin. Which, if you look at the Greek, I feel like I'm talking about my big fat Greek wedding, but if you look at the Greek, sin is simply to lose your way, to miss the mark. In the First Nations version of the New Testament that has been just published in the last six months or so, it uses terms from the First Nation, from native peoples, to tell the gospel. And sin there is to have a bad heart, a heart that's not working the way that it should. It is also to follow the wrong path. Now, I don't know about you, but I have had multiple times this past week when I have missed the mark, have lost my way, and my heart has not been healthy. And so what better place than here at church to confess that to the one who can put us on the right path and give us a pure heart, a clean heart, a healthy heart. So with that in mind, I invite you to join me in this prayer of confession and also listen for words of hope and assurance. Let us pray together. Compassionate God, true justice is right relationship. Help us see the forces that get in the way of our having truly caring, respectful, healing relationships with other people. Help us own our vulnerability to prejudice, judgment, and self-righteousness. We seek your righteousness, which we see in Jesus, the Word made flesh, who reconciles and renews, who rebuilds and redeems, who brings us into restored relationship with God, and who points the way to restored relationship with our neighbor. Forgive us, quench us, make us whole, all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, that's the New Testament, pages 27 and 28. Let us hear the word. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, 
naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Morning, friends. Believe it or not, it's been 50 years since I graduated from college. I look so young. It's been 50 years since I took Greek in seminary. And I got to tell you, it's still Greek to me. But something happened nearly 50 years ago that still is so fresh in my mind like it just happened last week. The question was, what difference would it make if you thought the person sitting next to you was Jesus Christ? It was a question my professor in seminary asked almost 50 years ago now. And our responses were varied. We'd never thought about that. We'd be delighted or exceptionally kind. We'd be on our best behavior. We'd be respectful, attentive to what this Jesus said or did. We'd be honored, awestruck, humbled to be in their presence and mindful of our behavior and words. And in ways, great or small, we'd want to show this person how much we loved, how much we appreciated them. How would you answer the question? When we were finished sharing our thoughts, the, what happened next was not something we expected because we were in a class on the sacraments, on baptism and the Lord's Supper. And our professor said, when you sit next to a baptized Christian, you are sitting next to Jesus Christ. In Martin Luther's words, the baptized are little Christs to be given the same love and care and respect that you'd give to the Lord Jesus himself. Friends, we are together the body of Christ with Christ as our head and our, gu and our guide and how marvelous to think that the Lord Jesus is here among us today next to us looking at us, hearing us. What a difference it would make in our families, don't you think, if we really honored one another in the way that we would honor the Lord Jesus. What a difference it would make in our conversations. What a difference it would make in our church meetings. Can I get an amen for that? <laughs> if we saw each other as Christ among us. And this week, nearly 50 years after that conversation and that class meeting, I was reminded of that as I read this week's scripture. Because Jesus says to his disciples what we just heard. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And who are the least of the members of our family? the hungry and thirsty, the naked and the stranger, the imprisoned or the sick. In the words of a hymn in our hymnal, these are the ones we should serve. These are the ones we should love. All these are neighbors to us and you. Yesu, Yesu. Fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. I got to tell you, these words aren't just throwaway lines. 
tossed off without a thought. Because if you read this passage, Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem, and in less than 72 hours, he will be as dead as a doornail after his arrest, trial, torture, and execution by the people who see him as a threat. This is the very last parable Jesus tells his disciples. It's, it's, it's as if he saved the best and the most important for last and is saying to us, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. Remember the last thing I taught you. And the parable is about the last judgment and how what truly, measure, truly matters will be measured in the end. And to me, there, there are several surprises here. The first is that everybody is surprised. Those who are sent to the way of blessing, they're surprised. When did we see? We, we didn't know that was going on. Those who are sent off to judgment are surprised. What do you mean? When did we not serve you? Surprises all around. It's kind of like some people are going to be surprised that I get into heaven, and I'm going to be surprised that they got there too. And secondly, this life or death assessment doesn't seem based on being a Christian or having the right answers or a certain set of beliefs or even squeaky clean virtues. What matters is how the vulnerable on the edges of life are treated. And finally, and this is really sobering for me, the assessment goes beyond my individual life. What's gathered before the glorious throne in the scripture is who? The nations. Entire groups of people, communities, races, realms, societies. It's sobering to think that in the end, my life isn't judged only by my individual actions, but by those of my entire community my entire land. So as a, person, a personal example, it'll sober me up to think that my life isn't simply weighed on its own, but as a white person, as a male, as an American, as someone who inhabits a, a planet that has been given to us to tend and care for. For, for good or ill, my life is not mine alone, and yours is not yours alone either. Intimately, our lives are connected to all other lives, especially those I might not notice, those who especially need my care and attention. Friends, we are all in this together. This lifeboat called planet Earth has got room for all of us, and how we move about on it makes a difference to all of us. And apparently what matters most is how we treat those easiest to forget or ignore or dismiss as unimportant or undeserving or unworthy. Apparently, in Jesus' eyes, they are worthy because they're the Lord Jesus in our midst and eternity hangs in the balance. As, as Lent began for me this year, I did something different. When I was in college one year, I gave up going to church for Lent. It was kind of cool <laughs> to do that. Uh, but, 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 but this year, I'm in a, a prayer group that meets weekly, and one of the members of that prayer group challenged all of us to read something to feed our souls. And so I took up a book that had been on my shelf for, for more than 10 years, Mother Teresa, Come Be My Light. I guess it was just waiting for the right time, and this Lent was the right time to read it. You may remember Mother Teresa, now St. Agnes. Mother Teresa, the saint of Calcutta, gave her life to serving the poorest of the poor in India, and she didn't, she didn't do so simply to serve the poor, but to be the love of God for them. God's love in her flesh, bringing meaning and happiness to their lives. She was convinced that in meeting their needs, she was meeting Christ's needs. In dealing with their thirst for care and acceptance, she understood that she was somehow quenching Christ's thirst on the cross. Christ's 
thirst for souls, as she says. And indeed, she saw a mystical connection between Christ's sufferings and the sufferings of the poor. Now, 10 years ago, when I bought this book and I saw Come, Come Be My Light, I thought that was Mother Teresa's prayer, that she was praying for Christ to be the light of her life. But then I read the book, and I learned that it was Christ who was making the request. Christ was asking Teresa to be his light in the world. As he showed her his heart, his pain, his compassion, his thirst to show love for the world's most suffering. And I think that's a beautiful image. It was, it was stunning for me to read that. Many, many people actively help the world's needy. There's no doubt about it. And whether they claim the name of Jesus, they are serving Jesus. They may be among those who are surprised who say, when did we see you, Lord, when we fed the refugee in Rwanda? They're doing holy work. But we followers of Jesus receive an added blessing if we have eyes to see. We're able to see that we're not only serving the poor, we're serving our Lord. Refugees aren't just refugees. If we have eyes to see, we can see the holy family fleeing for their lives in Ukraine or at our border. If we have eyes to see, we can see the homeless person, the homeless person who's on the front of your bulletin, not just as someone under the blanket, but as our Lord Jesus who said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. If we have eyes to see, we can see the face of Jesus in the face of a murdered George Floyd calling for his mama with his last breath. This Lent, as we move closer to the horrors of Holy Week and our sisters and brothers who are ill-clothed or drought-stricken, we can again see the naked and thirsty Jesus on the cross. And in Jesus' last horrible hours, if we could, wouldn't we give anything for the privilege of visiting him in that Roman jail so he wouldn't be alone? Wouldn't, be, wouldn't we be honored to comfort him as he carried the sin-sick world on his cross-burdened shoulders? Wouldn't we love to reach up and cover his nakedness, all this art that we have that has Jesus with some kind of loincloth? That is not true to history. The last humiliation was to die naked for everybody to see you and not to be able to do a thing about it. Wouldn't it be a gift and a blessing for us to be able to reach up and cover his nakedness or at least to give some moisture to those dry and cracked lips? Wouldn't we be blessed to stand near to feed his hunger for God's presence so he would not be alone? Mother Teresa taught her Sisters of Charity, the religious order that she formed. She taught the Sisters of Charity a five-word prayer to guide their lives. It's a prayer that you can pray because most of us have five fingers. Well, it was my great aunt who put her hand out on the chopping block and said to my great uncle, I dare you to cut my finger off. And he went whack, and that was the end of that. They were made for each other, I think. And she never could play the piano again. Most of us have five fingers, so we can remember this. You did it unto me. Remembering each act of compassion, each act of care, each act of love, you did it unto me. Can we remember that? Can we live that? That prayer can be our guide as we ask God to open our eyes, not just to see the poor, but to see the poor Christ still suffering in our neighbors and to ease his pain in theirs. You did it 
unto me. I want to tell you about a pastor. He's the pastor of St. John's United Methodist Church. His name is Volodymyr. And he lives in Lviv, Ukraine. There are probably only 50 members of their church. But since the war began a month ago, that tiny part of Christ's body has been housing and feeding and comforting refugees who have fled to their town from the eastern part of Ukraine. They offer these gifts for free because they see Jesus and they hear that voice, you did it unto me. And the guests who come to St. John's Church are stunned by their generosity and the grace of a free meal and a bed. And when they are asked why they do it, those disciples of Jesus simply say, that's what Christians do. And in addition to food and shelter, they share the other gifts of Christ the world cannot give. They offer hope and encouragement that God is with us all our days, even days of terror. They don't just offer physical gifts, but gifts that endure forever. And, 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 and why do they do it? Because in the stranger they welcome, they see the same Jesus who is given, given these gifts of hope and encouragement and presence to them. Such gifts are to be shared, not hoarded and kept to ourselves. So may that be true for us as well. May our eyes be opened. May we see our poor Jesus next to us and serve and share what is needed not only for this life, but living water, the bread of life, Christ's healing and power and presence and freedom. Pray God, that we do so not because we must, but because we may. I invite you, I wanted to highlight a couple of things. This picture on the front, titled Homeless Jesus, it looks like just a homeless person on a bench, right? And you can't necessarily see it on this picture, but if you look closely at the statue, the nail prints on the feet are kind of a dead giveaway that it is the homeless Jesus on that bench. And this insert, I invite you to take this home. Don't put it in recycling for once, but put it on your refrigerator, put it in your Bible, put it on your mirror, so that each day as you go through your life, you might offer the prayer, Lord Jesus, open my eyes today that I may see, serve, and love you. So that your eyes may be open to see Christ and hear that voice that says, you did it unto me. In that weekly prayer group that I mentioned, one prayer we say each week includes this phrase, O oh God, we pray that we may delight in your will. Not that we just kind of tolerate it, not that we put up with it, not that we grumble about it all the time, even though we do it. Uh, I'm going to love my neighbor, but it's killing me. Oh God, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways not to our glory, but to the glory of your name. May it be so. May it be so. Amen.
when I was in youth group more than 50 years ago, one of our youth counselors had a prayer list. I'm pretty convinced that that prayer list and the prayers that he offered kept some of us out of jail. But we didn't know until we were adults that every day for years he had prayed for us. I don't know if you've got a prayer list. Some of the folks in my Monday group have one, and I keep one. It's a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. And once a month I check it and see how God has answered prayers or responded to them, or I add new names, take names off, this kind of thing. I don't know if you brought prayers with you today, but, but I have some that I would like to share with us, with names. I want to invite you in the coming days to pray for everyone whose name sounds like Vladimir. It could be Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Zelensky, or Vladimir, the pastor of that St. John's United Methodist Church in Lviv. Interestingly enough, Vladimir in Russian means ruler of peace. We've been told to pray for our enemies, and so let us pray. As Vladimir in Lviv prays, that his Russian sisters and brothers will turn away from their ways of war. That Vladimir, the president of Russia, will turn away from the ways of war. That his brothers and sisters in Christ will continue to turn toward their neighbors to welcome them as they flee violence. So pray for Vladimir, all the Vladimirs. I invite you to pray for my friend Cole. Cole is a, a, a seventh grader who is participating in, in confirmation at Williamsburg Church, and he's stuck with me as his prayer partner. And um, he told me this past week that his Aunt Luba has a mother and a father that are trying to get out of Ukraine. They have made it to Hungary, but they won't let her father stay easily because he didn't bring his college diploma with him when he fled Ukraine. I don't even know where my college diploma is. I certainly wouldn't say, oh, 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 wait, I need to get my college diploma as I run off for my life. So pray for Cole and his family. I invite you to pray for my friend Clark, who was married for 66 years, and for the last 17 years, his wife didn't know who he was as they did the long goodbye. He faithfully took care of her, and now he's not quite sure what to do with himself. And so I ask for prayers for Clark that he would be able to find a good path forward. And I ask you to pray for Matt, a guy that is in Greensville Correctional Center. He's there for murder. I write to him. He writes to me. Um, he's really a good guy. Made a terrific, horrible, terrible mistake. But he has turned his life to God. So pray for, 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 for Matt. Pray for Donna, the chaplain that works in that correctional center. And then pray for Max, the guy who um, works on my heating and air conditioning. Because you see, Max is from Ukraine too. And his father and his brother are stuck in Odessa. And so he worries about them. He calls them as he is able to. Sometimes he's able to get through because they're out in the open air and not in a shelter. We can read all we want to in the Daily Press or the Times-Dispatch or the Washington Post about Ukraine, but other places of violence and hardship and hunger and difficulty, behind every one of those headlines is a human being, somebody who looks like you, somebody who has the same hopes and aspirations as I do, somebody who needs to know that God has not forgotten them. And remember, whatever you do for them, you did it unto Christ. So I invite you, with those in mind and the prayers and the concerns and the hopes and the anxieties that you brought with you today, to bow with me in prayer as we offer a shared prayer together. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for all your gifts so freely bestowed upon us and all 
whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of life. Above all, for the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the hope of glory and the means of grace. Grant us such an awareness of your mercies, we pray, that with truly thankful hearts we may give you praise not only with our lips, but, but in our lives by giving ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. We offer prayers now for all those with whom we share the journey, for our loved ones, those who have been given to us, and to whom we have been given. We pray for those whom we have loved, who are now absent from us. And we pray for those we know who face particular trials and tests this day and this week. We entrust all who are dear to us to your never failing love and care, not only for this life, but for the life to come, knowing that you will do for them and for us for far more than we can desire or pray. And so, O oh God, into your hands we commit our spirits, for you have redeemed us. We pray that you would keep us as the apple of your eye and hide us in the shadow of your wings. And we pray, dear Lord, keep watch with all who work or watch or weep this day. And give your angels charge over those who somewhere are asleep. Tend the sick, we pray, and give rest to the weary. Soothe the suffering. Bless the dying. Pity the afflicted and shield the joyous, all for your love's sake. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. I understand that because of the pandemic, y'all have not yet returned to the practice of passing offering plates around, and that's fine. You know how to do this. You can give online. You can... Um, offer your gift at the end of the service or before the service as you enter or leave this building. There are many ways that we can participate in the healing work of Christ. Uh, I saw the sign as I came in today, pray for Ukraine. I would invite you to add not only your prayers for Ukraine, but also your gifts. There is a, a, a fund that I believe this congregation is contributing to with the United Methodist Committee on Relief to help churches like St. John's United Methodist Church in Lviv to, to uh, welcome refugees. In the coming months, we'll have the uh, annual conference, and I know that some congregations in our district, perhaps not this one, but others, will be preparing health kits, hygiene kits, flood buckets to help people in need. Um, there's always an opportunity to feed the hungry uh, in our local community, whether it's through an event like food, uh, cans for conference that happens, or simply through the generosity of your congregation week in and week out. There are many ways that we can be the hands and feet, the eyes, the heart of Jesus. Jesus said, when you have done it to the least of these, you have done it to me. And that's more than just an invitation. It's an admonition. Our faith compels us to put love into action. To follow Jesus of Nazareth is to take, heart, take to heart his call to care for his children, which we do through the giving of our gifts. So I invite you to join in this prayer that you find in your bulletin. A drink of water, a visit, a meal. May the gifts we give extend to others the blessings we ourselves have received. Welcome, nourishment, liberation. Amen. How many of us missed this during the pandemic? You know, 
John Wesley said we ought to have communion every week, just like most of us eat breakfast every week. It's good for our souls. But here we are. We at least can do it monthly as the gathered body of Christ. Those of you who have your individual packs, I invite you not to open those. Don't open those. Step away from the individual packs until the time. Don't want to hear anything. <laughs> Those of you who are online, I invite you to make sure that your uh, basic elements of this meal are ready. And I invite all of us to turn to uh, page 15 for this spoken responses are there as we share in this meal to which all are invited who love the Lord Jesus who would like for their life to look like his and who are committed to sharing his life and love with all they meet. If that describes you, you are most welcome to come to this table at which he presides. My brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and became subject to evil and death, your love remained steadfast. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Easter feast that renewed by your word and sacraments and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for all those who love you. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant being born in our likeness. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke the bread, gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, it is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and again gave you thanks and praise, gave it to his friends and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you do this, remember me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, God, that gathered here out of love for you and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. 
through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And with the confidence of the children of God, let us offer the prayer that is always in season. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we many as we are are one body, for we share in the broken body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a means of sharing in the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to listen to the anthem, and then we will share in the meal.
as we come to the time for the meal, I invite you, those of you who have your individual packets, to come to, to, to open those and to share in the meal, remembering the words, the body of Christ given for you, and remembering also the words, the blood of Christ given for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. And be grateful. We will, in addition, serve the choir first, and then you will come as the Spirit leads you. The table is ready. The feast is prepared. Won't you come? Body and blood of Christ given for you. 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 The body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this meal in which you have given yourself to us. Send us forth by the power of your spirit into the world you love so much so that we might seek you in our neighbor and love you in them and in each other that we may delight in your will. All to your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm sending you out into a world that's tough, that's full of heartache and terror and disappointment and uncertainty, a world of fear. It is also a world that has not been forgotten by God. And God loved the world so much that not only did he send his son into the world to save it, but he is sending you now into the world be healing and hope and encouragement and peace in a world that knows little of those things. God is depending on each one of us to be about God's work. And we cannot do it on our own. So I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will be with you, that the love of God will strengthen you, and the friendship of the Lord Jesus will keep you company Friends, do not be afraid, for the Lord Jesus goes with us. Amen? Amen. Amen.